Hey, Center Grace family, it is another Wednesday, and so that means we're going to be doing another devotional video uh, today, and we're going to shift gears now and begin looking at some comparison clauses throughout the New Testament. Now, if you're like me, when it comes to the idea of comparisons, it may make you feel kind of uncomfortable. Um, anytime people start uh, comparing me, I, I feel like there's always this fear that begins to well up uh, inside of me that I'm not in some way, shape, or form going to stack up or measure up. And in the New Testament, there are a number of places where Jesus or uh, the scripture, the author of, of scripture, Paul or someone, will make a comparison of some sort. And I think the comparisons biblically are there not necessarily to make us feel uncomfortable or as if we can't measure up in some way, shape or form, but truly these comparison clauses are present to both encourage us on the one hand and challenge us on the other. So over the coming weeks, as we look at some of these comparison clauses, you're gonna see that in every one of these, there's gonna be an encouraging element to it. Like when Jesus says, as the Father loved me, so I love you, love one another. And then there are also other places where we're gonna receive a real word of challenge. Um, even in that, that comparison clause that I just quoted, in John, Jesus says, as the Father loved me, I love you. That's encouraging, but then he makes a command. He gives a challenge, right? Love one another. Well, today, just because this was the one that I was reading this morning, we're going to be looking at John 20, 21. In John 20, verse 21, Jesus says, peace be with you. This is right after he has raised from the dead. He shows up. His, his disciples are kind of huddled together in a room with the doors locked. Jesus shows up and he says, peace be with you. And then he says, as the Father sent me, so I send you. As the Father sent me, so I send you. Now think about this for just a second, because there are actually two words of encouragement. The encouragement comes when Jesus first and foremost says, peace be with you. Now, think about the context here. The disciples had just failed Jesus. They had just run for fear of their lives when Jesus was betrayed by Judas um, and then crucified. So the disciples had scattered, and the first words that Jesus gives to them or says to them when he shows up, he doesn't rebuke them. He actually speaks a word of peace. It demonstrates, I think, the real heart of Jesus and just how his heart overflows with a love even toward his rebellious and wayward disciples, just like me and you. So Jesus, first and foremost, gives a word of encouragement. He says, peace be with you. But then he says, as the Father sent me, so am I sending you. Just because the disciples had failed, it did not count them out of the ability to be used for the sake of ministry. The disciples had blown it. But Jesus knew that the Father could still use them, that God, through the work of his Holy Spirit, was going to do a transformative work in the hearts and lives of his disciples so that they could still be used. Just as the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. So again, I think this is a, a deep word of encouragement that Jesus gives to his disciples. But there's also a word of challenge. Think about that idea of, as the Father sent me, so I send you. It means that on the one hand, there's going to be an aspect of mission to this challenge. This idea of being sent, as Jesus says, the Father sent Jesus. It was uncomfortable, we could imagine, for Jesus to leave the right hand of the Father to condescend to earth for the sake of salvation. In the same way that Jesus was sent on mission, that the Father sent him out to do the work of redemption, so it is that God sends us out. It's a comparison clause. In the same way that the Father sent the Son, so it is that Jesus sends us. And that's going to come. This mission is a challenge that's going to come with some discomfort. It's not going to be easy for us to be on mission as ambassadors for Jesus. It means that we're gonna to have to be involved in the lives of people who are near to us, um, but far from God. Their lives aren't, aren't gonna look like our lives. Um, at times, we're gonna to have to have difficult conversations with them. 
It's going to take a lot of energy emotionally. It's probably going to take a lot of time for us to invest in them because we have to be on mission. But how? How are we supposed to be on mission? And this is where I think, again, this comparison clause shines. Think about how it is that Jesus came. It's not just that Jesus came on mission. Jesus also came incarnationally. There was an incarnation. Jesus pulled on human flesh. He embodied the message that he was trying to give. I was thinking about this recently. Again, I've been studying through the Gospel of John just in my personal devotions for a while now. And I was thinking even just yesterday about the phrase in John 1, the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Maybe when you were growing up, maybe your parents at times would say, hey, do as I say, not as I do. I can remember my parents at times telling me when I was learning how to drive to not drive too fast, even though my parents would drive too fast sometimes. Do as I say, not as I do. Well, there's always going to be a little bit of disconnect between the message, the words that we say, and the way that we live. There's always going to be a little bit of dissonance there for us. But for Jesus, he was the perfect embodiment of his word. Have you ever thought about that? There was total and complete unity. There was total and complete integrity in Jesus. He never had to say to someone, do as I say, not as I do. Everything that Jesus said, he also did. Because Jesus lived incarnationally. And that's our challenge as well. It's not just that we're on mission. It's that we have to be on mission incarnationally. Think about it this way. The, the, the connection and the, the way that these two words work and play off of one another. It would be easy sometimes to just go be on mission and then to, and then to retreat, right? To, to move away from the people that, uh, that we were trying to minister to. Well, what Jesus says, though, is as the Father sent me, so am I sending you. I want you to be on mission, but I want you to be on mission incarnationally. I want you to live in the midst of these people. I want them to be able to see your life and to begin to see a growing unity in your own life between the words that you say on my behalf, as my ambassadors, as my disciples. I want other people to begin seeing that growing unity that you are beginning to really embody the message that you're proclaiming on my behalf. And think about how that worked out in the lives of these first disciples. There was a growing unity in their lives too. So again, this, this comparison clause in John 20, 21 challenges and encourages us. God wants to use us. There's the encouragement. He speaks words of peace over us, even though we've failed him time and time again. Nevertheless, God wants to use us. That's encouraging. But there's a challenge because Jesus wants us to go and he wants us to be. He wants us to be on mission and to be involved in the lives of other people. But think about the temptations that exist for us in the midst of these things. Think about how easy, rather than being on mission and living life incarnationally with our neighbors, think about how sometimes it would be easier for us to just stay away, to cloister ourselves, to just hang out with other people who already know Jesus, who are already disciples. It would be so easy for us to, to just stay away, to, to cloister up rather than be on mission, to just be insulated or insular um, from other people. Think about how easy it would be for us to remain silent rather than speaking on behalf of Jesus. Think about how easy it would be for us to continue living and practicing hypocrisy if we're not involved in the lives of other people. Rather, what God is calling us to, rather than all of these temptations, he's calling us to mission and he's calling us to incarnation. He wants us to really go and be involved in the lives of the people that live around us. There's encouragement there and there's challenge there. We're going to be looking at these comparison clauses for the next few weeks just to see the ways that our hearts can be stirred both through encouragement and also through challenge. 
But for now, for today, I want you to think about John 20, 21. What would it look like for you to be on mission and to live incarnationally right where you are for the sake of the gospel? We love you guys, and we'll see you on Sunday.